inviting me here, right down the road. <clears throat> it's nice to be back at, at ITAMP, <clears throat> where we've had many wonderful, wonderful quantum conferences over the years. <clears throat> Pardon my voice, I've been, <clears throat> I've been losing it in my subway train, stopped for 20 minutes, so I had to sprint from Harvard Square in order to get here on time. That's also I'm a little on the damp side. <clears throat> <laughs> so the organizers um, asked me to talk about quantum coherence in photosynthesis, um, a topic which in a grandiose way goes under the, you could call the phrase quantum life. So quantum effects in living systems. <clears throat> now, um, uh, I would say that not alone a lot is known about where quantum effects are present in living systems. <clears throat> There's hints that it might be taking place in the, uh, in the um, magneto um, detection system of robins and birds and even dogs now. And also <clears throat> in the sense of smell of, um, of uh, <clears throat> fruit flies and again, perhaps dogs. But this is all very indirect evidence, so we don't really know if quantum mechanics is playing a role there. However, in photosynthesis, as I'll describe, <clears throat> not only is it very clear that quantum coherence is playing a very important role, but in fact, I will argue and, that <clears throat> photosynthetic organisms have done an amazing job at, at, at a very sophisticated job at using quantum coherence in order to give very high energy, efficient, energy transport efficiencies. <clears throat> so first, I'll describe a little bit about what's going on in photosynthesis very briefly, and then I will present <clears throat> a... Um, a general a hand waving yet quantitative theory of how to optimize quantum transport in the presence of Anderson localization, environmental noise, and decoherence. And in fact, I'll, I'll nail this down by uh, a few years ago, I had to give a talk about this, and there was no whiteboard. And of course, I don't use PowerPoint because PowerPoint is a tool of Satan. And, um, <laughs> and so I had to explain this without any visual aid, so I developed an interpretive modern dance. And so partway through, I will give you an interpretive modern dance, which I claim about, about Anderson localization and coherence and decoherence. And I claim that after I mathematize this interpretive modern dance, you'll understand exactly what's going on. Thank you very much. Yeah, the hot water maybe is not, not the right stuff here. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Jose. <clears throat> okay. So um, about um, seven years ago now, um, uh, <clears throat> in the spring of 2007, I got up one morning and I read in the New York Times that purple, so green bacteria, green sulfur-breathing bacteria were performing quantum computations. And uh, because my background is to build quantum computers and do quantum information processing. And in our quantum information group at MIT, we had a hysterical laugh at this crackpot idea. This is the most insane thing we'd ever heard. Um, but because it seemed that something was going on, then, and because our tradition in our group meeting is if it seems like something's going on in the world, then somebody gets designated to go and check it out. So they said, Seth, you're sufficiently insane to check this out, so go check it out. And I met up with Alan Asper Guzik, who just got tenure here in the chemistry department. He was an assistant professor then. He knew about this work. The work was work, um, a very lovely piece of femtosecond uh, spectroscopy for wave mixing done by the Fleming Group in Berkeley. And actually, it gave very pretty, pretty compelling, very compelling evidence for the presence of quantum coherence in excitonic transport in photosynthesis. And though it was pretty easy, they were claiming this paper that these bacteria were in some sense doing a quantum search, a particular kind of quantum algorithm for the energy in the exciton to find the reaction center, search for and find the reaction center where it could be turned into chemical energy. This turned out to be a bunch of BS, but it was in fact doing something which could be termed a quantum walk. Now, a quantum walk is a coherent version of a classical random walk. You know, in a classical random walk, you kind of like wander around at random, you diffuse outward at a rate that's proportional to the square root of t, right? <clears throat> I didn't have time to drink enough beer this morning to make this really compelling. <clears throat> um, uh, <clears throat> whereas in a quantum walk, the, um, because you have an exciton, for instance, in this case, or any quantum particle, and some structure through which you're trying to move, if the different paths can interfere with each other, then 
the, this exciton or this, this excitation or this particle can actually diffuse coherently through this structure, which means it can actually propagate ballistically through the structure. So in fact, quantum walks are significantly faster than classical walks, and apparently, these, um, and in quantum computation, they're used to solve a variety of hard problems. And apparently, these green, and actually turns out purple bacteria and green plants, are using quantum walks to enhance the efficiency of energy transfer. So that's the background. And let me show you. Yeah, let me, let me, let me draw a picture. Okay, <laughs> I mean, it, the problem is it's hard to draw a picture. This is a wonderful field to go into because there are wonderful Google images of all these photo complexes. But I mean, a typical kind of thing, so what happens is a photon comes in and it gets absorbed in a, I'm drawing a picture of a chromophore. This is like a, a porphyrin molecule or chlorophyll molecule. It comes in and it excites an electron, an electron hole pair, a bound Frankel exciton in the, uh, this porphyrin ring. So this is on a very small scale, you know, sub-nanometer scale. <clears throat> and then, if you look at these photocomplexes, in fact, in these green bacteria, you, well, you have these gigantic tubes, <clears throat> tubes of these circa uh, 4 times 10 to the fifth chromophores, chlorophyll molecules. And the uh, exciton shows up in here, and it rattles around in here, and then it gets to, there are these structures down here. There's something called the base plate, and then there's other structures, which are called FMO, phenomathies olsen complex. This is the phenomathies olsen complex. I've made seven dots for the seven chromophores that are in there. And then down here, you have something called the reaction center, which is a place where the charge, where the energy in the exciton charge separation takes place and the energy in the exciton is harvested and put aside for later use. Okay? <clears throat> Eugene is looking at me. He's giving me the old eyebrow, eyebrow look. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, yeah, right. Well, let me take it from me, Eugene. It's true. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, you asked about time scales. So um, this initial absorption and the initial absorption and creation of the exciton and relaxation of the vibrational modes within the porphyrin molecule is around um, uh, 10 femtoseconds. Um, in this particular, uh, these, these chromophores are very tightly bound, so the, the, the coupling uh, from chromophore to chromophore among these 10,000, the coupling enhance basically the velocity that it's moving around. This is, the, well, the time scale goes as basically on the order of um, 100 femtosecond, 1 over 100 femtoseconds, so it's a 100 femtosecond coherent propagation, initially coherent propagation. When you get to move from one structure to another, it takes around a picosecond, and the lifetime of the exciton is only on the order of a nanosecond. So um, actually, you do have five orders of magnitude in which to play around here. And even if you're talking about this um, propagation amongst these chromophores, there are um, uh, four orders of magnitude. You, know, you have 1,000, 10,000 hopping times, which could be coherent or incoherent within the lifetime. So in fact, there's a lot of room for quantum mechanics to, to play a role here, which I actually, I mean, I had no notion of this. I knew nothing about photosynthesis when I first started working on it, except it's like, yeah, light from the sun comes in and gets harvested by plants, right? So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I, it, it never would have occurred to me that you could have really extensive quantum coherence playing a role in living systems because let's face it, living systems are hot, wet places, right? <clears throat> However, if you see, you can see from these time scales that the this, this trick is the separation of time scales here. That these couplings, these time scales, are very fast. Um, they're, they start out at kind of optical time scales, uh, visible, uh, and then they are still, you know, it's all over in a blink of an eye. Yeah. yeah. No, at room temperature. At room temperature. Yeah. So the, the radiative lifetime may be nanoseconds, but the state lifetime is picosecond. Not for Frankel exitons in 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 uh, in a in a chromophore. It's no. Usually the internal yeah, I, I know that that for Frankel exitons in general, this is true. This is, but but remember, um, 
I agree with what you say. This is another reason to be suspicious of why, how this could happen. However, the observed, you just do pump probe on these things at, at, at room temperature in the lifetime as a nanosecond. Well, no, I, I yeah, yeah. I mean, well, uh, uh, another thing to think about here is that uh, things have been photosynthesizing for more than a billion years. And that's a long time to get it right. And in fact, <laughs> I'm going to argue that in fact there's, there's been a lot of tuning of um, different kinds of parameters which could have been tuned by, which could conceivably have been up, up, tuned by natural selection to get things right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, in fact, as we'll see in a moment, decoherence is important that things decohere. So, in fact, they are not propagating. They're pro Nobody knows what's happening in this thing called the chlorosome with these hundreds of thousands of things here. But here in this, the, the femtosecond spectroscopy indicates that the coherent propagation within this Fenner Matthews Olsen complex takes place over just a few chromophores. But that's actually enough to give a large advantage, as I'll describe now, because I think it might be time to. I, I sense and I feel the need to dance. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if this is a 40-minute talk, it's, I feel like my feet are itching here. <clears throat> so um, anyway, that's what this kind of thing looks like. And do you mind if I now? Oh, I'll leave it up there for the, just for the heck of it. <clears throat> so, um, so to show how these things are actually doing a great job, let's go to a much simpler system, which is just propagation of a single particle, which could be an exciton, it could be an electron, it could actually be a photon moving through a crystal or something like that. It's, it's moving along a one-dimensional line. The coupling from one point to another is, we'll just call that J. And then the, uh, the site disorder we'll call delta omega, so the average energetic disorder per site. And let's just not bother about the disordering, disordering the couplings for the moment, because I don't have, I'm worried about this marker going out, and I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> okay? So this, for instance, could be a, um, uh, uh, this could be a, also could be a spin, uh, an, a single spin propagating in an XY model or a Heisenberg model. could be anything like that. So this is a very generic picture. So <clears throat> what generically happens for this? So <clears throat> um, uh, <clears throat> if J, suppose that J is greater than delta omega. If J is delta, greater than delta omega, then this thing can actually propagate coherently for a ways along this line. So it undergoes, and now, now I'll begin my dance, it undergoes a wave-like propagation along this line. And if the line, if there were no energetic disorder, then the wave-like propagation would just simply persist, and you could just zoom right through in a ballistic fashion, which would be great. Of course, this is not what happens, because there is disorder. Then what happens is the wave-like propagation goes for a while, but then gradually Anderson localization and destructive interference kicks in, and then you're stuck, right? And in one dimensions, you're stuck for a real long time. Actually, these systems, these excitons have dipolar interactions, but those dipolar interactions are not going to get you unstuck before you die. Now, this is really bad. Because in one dimension, of course, you're exponentially localized. And so now nothing is going to happen. OK. <clears throat> um, and indeed, when uh, Alain asper Guzik and I um, and uh, his postdocs and graduate students, we did an ab initio simulation of the propagation of excitons through this FMO complex, where all the energies of the chromophores and all the couplings and their relative orientations are all known. So we took all the parameters for this model from, from observation, and then we simulated an exciton hopping through this, and at low temperature, even though there are only seven chromophores for the thing to go through, the exciton got completely stuck. It went almost nowhere, yeah. 
compared with what? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so if this is J is like the nearest neighbor dipole coupling here. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be dipole. I, I'm just saying, think of it as just a local, a local interaction. In fact, in these systems, the, the long-range dipolar couplings are very ineffective at, at moving things around. It's the local interactions that are important. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, then, well, what happens as you raise the temperature? So here, you go, here the thing's going. It's propagating along. It's stuck because of destructive interference and Anderson localization. But then, if you raise the temperature and like, it starts to wiggle around a bit, it can get unstuck. And when it gets unstuck, it can propagate again by the localization length before it gets stuck again. And then it gets unstuck and propagates again. It actually spreads out uh, by the localization length, but, but for, for physiological reasons, I'm unable to actually demonstrate this. <laughs> so it spreads out, and you see getting unstuck, stuck, and unstuck. And so what you actually see is that you take over longer time, over short time scales, you're taking a coherent quantum walk, and over long time scales, you take a classical walk with the step size L, that's the step size, and the step time is just the decoherence time, because that's how long it takes you to get unstuck. And that tells you that this thing will spread out with a time like this, where this is the localization length, and this is the decoherence time. Okay? I think that you'll agree. This is the rate of the spread of this, of this over longer scales classical walk, short scales coherent quantum walk. All right? People happy with this? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So, so <clears throat> at very low temperatures, the decoherence time is constant, and it's just given by the, the, the uh, so-called reorganization energy, by the coupling of this, this uh, to the this exciton to, this, to its surroundings. But over a longer time, it generically raises, goes up linearly as the temperature. Two, two more time scales are also relevant, which is the fluctuation time scale, the free energy level. So you have mentioned two time scales. Right. Really uh, in, a, in a little bit, I'm going to mention three more, right. And those ones included, yeah. And uh, also, the total energy dissipated upon taking each step. Exactly. So for the moment, let's look at a model which is just pure decoherence, which is decoherence. It's as if the environment is figuring out where the exciton is. So it's as if every now and then it measures it in the site basis. And in just a second, I will do a different interpretive modern dance to try to take into account all these different time scales. I'm not sure how many I'll be able to put in, but we'll try. <clears throat> During the time when you're stuck, so you're not losing energy at all? No, not, not from this exciton, no. No, There's, this, is, this is a unbiased walk, the energy's, the, and it's not going downhill. It's just wandering around for the simple reason that if you go downhill, you lose energy, and the energy is what you're trying to get. So the very last step here, you might lose 1% of the energy, but almost all the energy in the original photon, and this is a kind of like a red, if you like a red photon, uh, is, is in this exciton, and almost 99% of that energy makes it to this reaction just center. Flat just flat, yeah, it's hard to believe, right? But that's the way they do it. I wouldn't say that it is in reality, in nature it's flat, in your model it's flat. And in nature it's flat. Uh, not quite, they're, they're yeah. tiny, uh, right. I think I... that's quite important is like fluctuation dissipation theorem is a, is a, is a central uh, right. argument. Because I actually just said that, and I agree with you, I will continue. <laughs> 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 so I can't possibly disagree with such a fine confirmation of what I said, that there's a little tiny bit of, at this last stage, there's a little a tiny bit of downhill. Uh, there's a little tiny bit of downhill going here, and when you get to the reaction center, then it locks the exciton in, and a complicated process goes on, because you need four exitons to construct a carbon-carbon bond, to construct a covalent bond. So this is a very complicated process. Okay, I think I've got to speed up my interpretive modern dance. So this is, this is if the decoherence rate is less than 1 over the localization time, the time it takes to get localized. However, if you increase the, the decoherence rate and increase the temperature, then what happens is 
So now, if I may do this, this next part of the dance, now you're going along, but now you're kind of getting jiggled along all the time. You never make it to the localization scale, and then you like start you know, propagating back, and so you get decohered, and now you're doing a random walk over time scale shorter than the localization length. So when, and now let me mathematize that. So when the decoherence time, the decoherence rate is greater than the localization length, you see that now your step size, your step size becomes the average velocity of this system times the decoherence time, which is how far you can propagate in a ballistic coherent fashion, kind of by definition, <laughs> right, of the decoherence time. And your step time is once again the decoherence time. And so this is again the decoherence time. And you see that now this goes as V bar, which actually in a kind of high temperature limit for this system and with which in, uh, in just pure decoherence, this is actually just the average velocity is just two times the coupling, 2j times the square root of t times tau. And you see what happens is that at higher temperatures, oh, <laughs> thank you, John. <laughs> you see what happens is that at low temperatures where you're dominated by localization, that it makes sense to increase the decoherence rate, and then you'll go faster. Because all that time you're sitting around being localized, nothing has happened. It's like, you know, Jesus, I wish someone would like decohere me so I could like propagate again, you know. Ah, stuck again, right? Whereas if you're going really fast, then actually you're not taking advantage of the ability, ability to do coherent propagation at all. And what you actually get is um, a curve that looks like this as a function of temperature. For pure, again, for a model with pure decoherence, and I'll address this question of relaxation and other times as well, other time scales as well, you get something that looks like this. So here is your diffusion coefficient, which is just L squared over tau here and 4J squared tau there. And here's the function of temperature. It starts here. The diffusion coefficient goes up basically linear with, with temperature reaches a plateau, stays there for a while, and then comes back down. Because here, the diffusion is going as L squared over tau. And here, it's going as 2, 4, sorry, 4J squared uh, tau. So I suppose it goes as 1 over here. It goes as 1 over the temperature. And remember, our model consisted of, um, uh, it had no free parameters. So all the couplings to the environment, all the couplings, the hopping rates, all the energy disorders, everything was just given by measurement, came from measurement. So, so we are pretty confident that this model is a pretty good one. And you might well ask, you know, what is this temperature here? This corresponds to a decoherence rate that basically is one over the localization time. What do you think that temperature happens to be? Yeah, that's right. I was like, yeah, it's amazing. It's like 290 Kelvin. <laughs> 290K, yeah, it's, it's amazing, right? from, from what you conclude, you can, depending on your religious persuasion, then, you know, either God, she is one great quantum mechanical engineer, she really knows what she's doing, or gajillions of bacteria didn't die in vain. It's and, the, and it's the <laughs> principle that the universe conspired to give us exactly the number. Right, it's the right. Like, that's right, it's because of the cosmological <laughs> constant is what it is. I'd forget, this is a new, a different explanation, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, time. That's another, another time for another. Let's have that talk in another universe. For... <laughs> so you can eat, actually, if you can believe it, so, so these green bacteria, sulfur bacteria, they live in very, can live in very low, very low light environments. They're found, the most extreme low light environment is they're found thousands of meters underneath the ocean at hot sulfur vents where there are basically zero photons coming from the sun, and all they're photosynthesizing with is the black body radiation coming out of the vent, which, let's face it, is not a pretty skimpy diet. 
But uh, <laughs> you can see why it would happen. It's like, you know, here's this, this poor schmuck of a bacterium, and it's like, oh, thank God, I finally caught a photon. You know, last the children, the children will eat. Like, oh, oh, shit, I dropped, oh, you idiot, you dropped the exciton, the children will starve, right? You know, so, so for the, just for the, you know, marital relations amongst bacteria, it's important that, that this be true. <laughs> I was I was taking a few liberties about bacterial sex. <laughs> Bacteria do have sex, but okay. So now, let, actually, because I'm I'm um, uh, oh, I still have a little bit of time. So um, let me now uh, do as requested and do a more complicated model. And by the way, all these um, if you look at uh, what we actually call this effect, um, we call this the quantum Goldilocks effect. After the little girl with blonde hair who's wandering through the forest and she's lost and she finds a house where there's three of everything, you know, so she goes in and there are three chairs and one is too big and one is too small and one is just right, so she sits on that chair. And then there are three bowls of oatmeal on the table and one is too hot, one is too cold, the third is just right temperature, so she eats that up. And then she feels sleepy she goes into the bedroom, and there are three beds, and one is too hard, one is too soft, the other is just, just right. And so she lies down and goes to sleep. And at that point, the three bears who own the house come home. And what happens next is, depends on the version of the story. <laughs> anyway, so the quantum Goldilocks effect, we call it this because there is just the right interplay between coherence and decoherence, between dynamic noise, well, let's put it this way, between, between static disorder, which gives rise to localization. I mean, again, because these have dipolar interactions, they're not strictly localized, okay? But it, so far as the excitons are, current, are concerned, it doesn't matter. So they're not strictly localized, but if they're stuck for more than a nanosecond, they're dead, and the dipolar interaction won't do that. So the interplay between coherence and uh, destructive interference, that is to say localization, and dynamic disorder or decoherence. Um, and there's a just right level of decoherence, which actually, as my interpretive modern dance should have convinced you, happens when the decoherence time is equal to the localization time for these systems. Um, and now let's actually look at what happens at, at, uh, at finite temperature. <clears throat> yeah. Ah, so um, uh, so uh, what's happening is that uh, <clears throat> you actually are building up the the in in the, for instance with these green bacteria, where apparently the couplings are strong enough and the disorder small enough that you can propagate over many tens or hundreds of sites. Then this exciton, which is a quantum particle, is undergoing wave-like coherent propagation, and in even in cases where you have uh, where you have a very large amount of disorder. So suppose you're just trying to hop from here down to there, and here's this coupling J, and let's suppose that J is approximately equal to delta omega, then you're going to not be in good shape, right? Because, or J is, let's say, it's even just a little less than or equal to delta omega. Then, you know, you're spending most of your time up here by energy conservation. You don't get down there. And so what you really want is something, the environment to come along and whack you, <laughs> And you can see that the time scale you want it to whack you is a time when it takes just you've tunneled from here to there, you have your largest amplitude over here, and you want to get whacked then. So this is actually a very coherent process at the, at the small time scale. And um, but this is extremely surprising. This, this feature that quantum coherence was playing a role, which was found experimentally, was at first very surprising to photochemists who thought that everything was like weak coupling, Fermi-Golden rule, um, you know, strongly coupled to the environment because living systems are hot, wet places. But, in fact, the experimental evidence shows very strongly that something like this is going on. And so let me actually now go to... So did, 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 that, uh, did that tell you, Marlon? What, uh, good, great. <clears throat> so let, let me look, actually look at finite temperature. At, uh, fine, with temperature, with, with relaxation, let's put it that, with... Um, with relaxation and excitation, so finite temperature. Well, actually, the model is, is, is basically the same. 
So um, at finite temperature, um, if, if the temperature is a lot less than the coupling, so this is kind of the low temperature regime, then this thing behaves like a massive particle um, uh, and its kinetic energy we have basically one half and its mass basically ends up as being one over J. So this is the kinetic energy of this particle effectively. I mean, this is probably, if, you, if you're familiar with things like the Heisenberg model on spin systems, at low temperatures, these things all behave like massive, sorry, low excitation number, these all behave like massive particles. So this is approximately equal to the temperature, setting, setting H bar and, and, and Boltzmann's constant equal to 1. So, um, or, or actually, it's a one-dimensional thing, so it's T over 2. So V bar squared is approximately equal to JT. Um, at low temperature. And so uh, what you see, and this, this, uh, uh, this part of the analysis remains the same. So at very low temperature, when the relaxation rate, the interaction rate with the environment goes is much less than the localization time, you still are doing the same kind of steps so right here. The only distance over here is that now this V bar basically goes as a square root Oop. I guess are these are these these are actually dry erase markers. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this goes the square root of the temperature times J, and then we have times tau. And um, what you also find so the, the generic behavior of the uh, this relaxation rate or excitation rate is at low temperature. This goes as basically a constant, so-called the so-called reorganization energy. This is just the strength of the interaction between the exciton and the box, the molecule which is sitting. And this is, and at high temperature, <coughs> this is um, actually for the temperature less than a number of gamma, I'll just tell you what gamma is in the moment. And for high temperature, it goes as lambda T over gamma, where gamma is the rate of decorrelate, it's the, um, it's the inverse of the correlation time of the environment. So environmental correlations fall off as e to the minus gamma t. This is a very generic um, behavior for, um, for decoherence and relaxation rates. Um, at very low temperature, the, the, the temperature is not that important, and you're just <coughs> dominated by interchange with the environment from a coherent interchange. So for instance, like spontaneous emission. At higher temperatures, this becomes important. And what you find now is that when you draw this picture, you can get a whole variety of different behaviors, but I'll just draw a specific one. So here is the temperature. Here is the diffusion rate. It starts going up like here. Whoops, across the board right there. And then at exactly the same point there, it kind of levels off. And then this is the same point that we had before. And then at very high temperatures, it, it actually will go back down again. <clears throat> And the reason for this is that, as you can see here, is that, that the step size is now becoming, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, well, the, the, the average velocity is going up, which whereas before it was constant. So there's a variety of different behaviors. Let me finish off here, because I see my chairman uh, <laughs> standing right here. <coughs> so, <coughs> and if you want to look at our papers on this, um, basically by the same hand-waving argument combined with well-known features about the interactions of things like excitons and electrons and stuff like that, you can derive a whole variety of interesting behaviors as a, both diffusive and also we can do it with driven systems <coughs> as a function of temperature. However, they all have this feature that <coughs> initially destructive interference and localization is bad. And so increasing the temperature and increasing the interaction with the environment and adding decoherence is good. And then when you get to a certain point, and you get some polynomial behavior as a function of, of temperature here, the polynomial can de will depend on just the details of which regime you're in here. I mean, there, there are actually four different regimes here, depending on where the temperature is, depending on what the correlation time of the environment is. In each one of them, you get a different polynomial behavior, but they all have basically the same feature. Um, as my interpretive modern dance showed, that at low temperatures, you want to increase decoherence because decoherence is bad. You want to kill off destructive interference. And <clears throat> at sufficiently high temperatures, uh, decoherence is, is bad because then it prevents you from propagating in a coherent fashion. 
And um, by the way, <clears throat> so you can see there's a kind of a magic, <clears throat> um, uh, there's sort of a magic parameter here, which basically goes as lambda t over ga little gamma times uh, j. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, this is the sorry, the decoherence rate. Excuse me, the decoherence rate has, should be equal to the the uh, one over the, the decoherence time, and that goes as delta omega squared over j. This is the this is roughly the Anderson localization uh, rate here. So if you get a funny prediction, which is that what you really want here is you want j lambda t over gamma delta omega squared is approximately equal to 1. <laughs> so, so this model, uh, quantitative and hand-waving though it is, actually tells you where you get the best transport rate. And it does so in a quantitative fashion. There's a kind of a magic parameter right here. And if you go and look in living systems, in photosynthetic systems, for which this parameter, so that's a lambda, for which this parameter is known or measured, putting in you know, the, the known couplings, the known reorganization energy, the correlation, estimated correlation time of the environment, and the measured, uh, <clears throat> measured energetic disorder, you find that we did this for five different systems, and these numbers vary a lot. So individual j's, lambdas, gammas, delta omegas, they can all vary by an order of magnitude or more. But this number in the systems that we looked at is always around one, one and a half, something like that. <clears throat> Which again, I think the conclusion is, I don't know, either God is a great, she's a great quantum mechanical engineer, <laughs> or maybe the unquantized life is not worth living. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Speaker again. <clears throat> so, Seth, when I first heard about this as uh, at that DARPA meeting where I showed up as Matt Goodman, oh yeah, Pitbull, yeah, and, yeah. And, and you, you guys were blathering on about entanglement and discord and all kinds of stuff. Perhaps you've forgotten all this, but I have not. So that's all out the window. It's just first order coherence with these mechanisms interplaying with each other, and, and, and that's it. What do you mean, you guys? This reminds me, <laughs> this reminds me you, know, you know the story about the, the Lone Ranger and Tonto are riding along, and then suddenly they see a group of hostile Indians up ahead, so they turn around. Uh-oh, a group of hostile Indians back there. Try to go up there, more there, more up there. So Lone Ranger turns to Tonto and says, looks like we're in trouble, Tonto. And Tonto says, what do you mean, we, white man? <laughs> <laughs> I personally have never been blathering on about coherence or decoherence. Of course, or sorry, about, about uh, entanglement or discord. Of course, I mean, this, these things, this, the fact that they're... Yeah, and Brigitte Whaley, they wrote a paper on this, which actually is quite funny because I was the referee for Nature for this paper, and I said, well, this paper is correct, but, you know... It's not very interesting because these things are entangled in the same way that if I have a photon and the photon, you know, is like in this quantum superposition of being here and there at the same time, then the electromagnetic field is entangled. Right. So if I have a single particle in a superposition of being here and there, in this case it's an exciton, yes, there is entanglement in a kind of really stupid, dorky way. But it's really not made worth making a fuss about, because what's really going on is coherence. And the bizarre thing is I said, well, I don't think you should publish this paper because it's going to make a big fuss because people will talk about entanglement in living systems, and it really is not that important. What's important is coherence. And they published it anyway. <laughs> the editors were salivating so much to publish something about entanglement in living systems. So anyway, yeah. But, but I mean, it's like... My, well, I, no, let's not jump to conclusions, but uh, yeah, but uh, at least I'm not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Yeah, it, this, this does exhibit entanglement in the sense that if I have an exciton that is in a quantum superposition of being here and not there, plus being there and not here, then it's entangled. But come on. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, so uh, green bacteria, purple bacteria, um, green plants, uh, uh, and then a couple of weird little photosynthetic algae-like things. So, so you can basically calculate these, these parameters, even, yeah. even though those systems are like non-monotonic. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so you have J. Let me just write up this 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 magic parameter right here, over gamma delta omega squared is approximately equal to one. I'll call this lambda because it looks like the curve, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so, uh, so the, the to to find out these parameters in a system, they need to have done to have isolated this whatever the photo complex is. They need to have done uh, X-ray crystallography to figure out the orientations of the chromophores. But um, these basically, you can basically get most of these things. So this, you, this is just, you know, you, this is the uh, uh, inhomogeneous line wave, right? So that's a spectroscopic thing. Um, and then J and lambda, you can estimate, estimate from, for instance, 2D spectroscopy. And then this is like, this is a little bit trickier, the, the correlation time with the environment. Basically, people do these chemical, they, the environment is made up of these, these proteins on which the things, the chromophores are stuck, and they do these simulations of the vibrational bath of these. So, it, but, you know, they, they, they think they know it within a factor of two or so. So, yeah. I mean, so, yes, yeah, so, so, so there are, are a variety, for, in the cases, the different kinds, there, there's a huge variety of different sorts of photosynthetic complexes, they, they look very, very different from each other, from one to the other. And these j's and the lambdas and the gammas and the delta omegas are all, can be very different by, as I said, at least an order of magnitude from one to another. Yeah? Well, that would be fine, yeah. If it's yeah, so so basically, the the deco kind of on rather generic terms. I think maybe I wrote it down somewhere. Um, a very hand wavy argument, uh, again of the kind that, that the, since this is all about hand wavy arguments, I figure I I didn't want to. <laughs> a very hand wavy argument reproduces a fact which is known from at least localization in one dimensional that the localization length goes on the order of like something like pi squared times j squared over delta omega squared, something like that. Um, so the larger the coupling, the longer the decoherent, the coherence rate, the smaller the, the disorder, the longer, the longer you go. But you do get stuck eventually, right? I mean, the thing is like, and, and localization is a very powerful thing, certainly in one dimensions. You know, you, when you're stuck, you're really stuck. The wave packet just ceases to spread completely. In two and three dimensions, it, it, it ceases to spread and then it kind of oozes out a little bit, but it still gets very stuck. So static disorder and destructive interference is a very bad thing. The localization length? No, that, these are things that, well, uh, no. The, the way we, we figure out the localization length is that we, we actually simulate the uh, behavior of the excitons hopping through these bacteria. I mean, again, these couplings, you know, the, the different couplings, chromophore to chromophore coupling are known. So actually the Hamiltonians for these systems are, are quite, for some, for some of these systems are, are, are very well nailed down by experiment. Um, but this, I mean, we are doing a series of experiments actually on man, or should I say women-made systems, because in this case they're actually made by women, of um, J aggregates made by Dota Isola. And Angie Belcher's group at MIT, we have these artificial uh, photosynthetic-like systems, which are bacterial phages, so the, viral, the skeletons of bacterial viruses, which, have, which she and her group have coated with chromophores. We're trying to do these at experiments at different temperatures to, to capture this temperature dependence. So, but I mean, one can, I mean that, that temperature dependence is, this also holds true for things like conductivity Right, you know, so this is perfectly fine for electrons moving along carbon nanotubes as well. I mean, there's nothing that required to be that. Yeah. Coming back to the old experiment by Fleming five years ago. Seven now, yeah. We saw seemingly an enhanced rate of transfer from photo reception to reactor. And if yeah. you tried the, they characterized this as a kind of foreign searching, in which first order coherence is enough to give you right. So in that sense, 
So there's a little bit of an experimental motivation to think about a quantum-ish effect that will come from spontaneous emission, or even form of emission, and reabsorption. And so the question is, how do you put these things together? Yeah. So, so uh, I think you, maybe you weren't here at the beginning of my, uh, of my talk. So this was all inspired by this Fleming work in 2007. And Alan Asper Guzik and I went and Fleming's work, the paper you just alluded to. Yeah. So, um, uh, which was very mysterious at the time. So what Alan Asper Guzik and I did is we took the system, the Fenno Matthews Olson complex, where the Hamiltonian for the system is known very quite accurately. And we did an open quantum system simulation of excitonic hopping through that. And this model that I just described is an ex post facto. The simulations showed exactly this behavior, that, that the, at low temperature, you get almost no excitonic um, uh, transport. And, it, and then as the temperature goes up, you get, reach a maximum. And then at a certain point, it goes down again. Or actually, at the finite temperature model, it goes up. And then it levels off. And then eventually, it goes down again. So, this was exactly to address this paper by Fleming. So we actually were very confident that because, because the, the Hamiltonian of the system is very well known, we had a zero free parameter model. Um, we're very confident that this is what's going on there. This, so, this is very interesting. And you're the expert language and observer. So I look at this, I say, aha, he's got localization here. That's an easy Yeah. Over here, we've got final interference. Right. Different. Yeah. It looks like the same. Yeah. So I don't think that this, I mean, let's talk about that afterwards. If, I, I don't think this, I mean, I'm pretty sure that this, this, this particular curve that I drew is the interplay between decoherence and, uh, and localization. So let's talk about phono interference. I'm not sure if it, it might be the same thing. You know, it's often, you know, that as I, we know, because this is a diverse community here, different communities have different words for the same thing. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and when I talked with Fleming after, I mean, it, this is just a throwaway line in this paper, right? It just said, oh, maybe it's doing a quantum search. And which. Right, which they should have because it was wrong. <laughs> it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, with respect to, and again, whenever we say phase, we have to make a reference because without giving a reference, phase has no meaning. With respect to the initial excitation. Absolutely. So, and that lasted for a few hundred femtoseconds. Right. So, but those phases are induced by the, by laser. By the laser. By the laser yeah. pulse. So one has to be very careful. So now here, if you say that this is, if it is with respect to the initial excitation, and after 5 picosecond, 10, 15 picosecond, there is absolutely no phase relation. I wasn't, wasn't claiming that. I wasn't claiming so that. One, one, uh, in spectroscopic terms, it's with respect to the initial excitation. However, uh, here, and validly so, uh, the idea here is that uh, here, um, the way a chromophore is excited uh, is identical whether it's excited by light or from the adjacent. Yeah. Side, which is I, valid. I think that's right. This is, this is a, there's a, again, this is a nomenclature issue. So yes, it's, yes, yes. And so, I mean, yeah, so I don't, let's not argue about it yet, because yes. I think we agree about this. Yeah, so Fleming, so in this paper, yeah, so they were wrong to say it was quantum search, because it wasn't quantum search. And uh, when I, you know, and I got upset about that because I'm a quantum information guy, so I like the words to be right. So then when we went back and said, look, okay, it's not a quantum search, but it is a quantum walk, which is a quantum algorithm. And we talked with Fleming, and I went to said Fleming said, oh, well, that's what I meant anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank the speaker one more time, and that was great. <laughs> we'll resume again at, um, oh, I don't know, around 10.50. What time is it now?